Hello everyone and welcome back to HTBB Online. I'm Anna. And I'm Div. And we're both Connect Group Leaders here at HTBB. It's been a great start to the new year here at HTBB. And just yesterday, we had SPTC Graduation Day where we celebrated our second and third cohorts graduating from SPTC. Yeah, it was really exciting. And some of us have actually been waiting two years since the lockdown to graduate together. So we just want to say a huge congratulations to all our friends who graduated yesterday. Congratulations. And today, we're really excited to have uh, everyone here at service again today. Uh, today, we have Jacinta kicking off part one of the Mark series. Yep. And as usual, before that, we're going to enter into a time of worship. So let's prepare our hearts and let's worship together. He can't move 
my race is over Ready to see you face to face Even with the final breath that you give me Would I testify to your gospel of Grace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your hand of covering and hand of protection that has been upon us throughout this COVID season, O oh Lord. Uh, we pray that even as we enter into this new year, that your peace and comfort will be with all of those, O oh Lord God, who have suffered loss during this season, but especially, O oh Lord God, all of us, O oh Lord, who are still persevering through this. We pray for your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us throughout this entire new year, O oh Lord. Yes, Lord, and we just want to remember uh, our nation as well as we recover from the recent uh, floods. Lord, we pray for uh, all the post-flood cleanup efforts, so Father, and we continue to pray for all the individuals, families and businesses that are trying to rebuild uh, their lives again, oh Father. We pray that you give them the resources that they need and that you lift their spirits up, oh Father, and just uh, be with them uh, as they continue to rebuild, oh Father. Lord, we also want to pray for all the leaders here at HTBB. We thank you for your continual guidance and your continued uh, leadership, O oh Lord God, through your Holy Spirit. We thank you um, that you continue to be faithful throughout every person who's serving every ministry, O oh Lord. And we thank you also for the SPTC graduates from yesterday, O oh Lord. May you continue to be with them in their journeys, even as they graduate, O oh Lord, uh, and to whatever thing they're going to serve you in in the future as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right now, we're going to watch HTBB News and it's also a chance for us to give. So watch out for the QR codes that will pop up on the screen. So let's give as we watch HTBB News. Starting the 1st of January, I'd love us all to read the Bible in one year together in 2022. You can download the app from the App Store. Just 10 to 15 minutes a day of reading or listening to the Bible will change your life. When we put scripture in our mind, it changes the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to know what Jesus is like, read the Bible. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you diligently study the scriptures because in them you think you'll find eternal life. But these are the scriptures that testify about me and you fail to come to me for life. So this next year, let's read the scriptures and receive life in Christ. And we also have Youth Bible in one year. I've been using Youth Bible in one year for over two years now, which means I've listened to the entire Bible twice. And you should too. Well, I love that it interlaces commentary with Bible passages, and who wouldn't love listening to Nikki Gumbel's voice? So if you're a youth and you've never tried Bible in one year, try Youth Bible in one year. We're excited to have Jacinta, one of the pastors here at HDBB, to be with us today speaking to us as well. She's married to Abel and they have a beautiful little son named Levi. Yeah, and Jacinta's going to be speaking to us today about the way in the wilderness. So let's lean in, uh, get your notebooks out, and let's listen to the word. Hey everyone, it's great to be with you all today. If we haven't met, my name is Jacinta, and I'm one of the pastors here at HTBB. It is the second Sunday of the year, so Happy New Year. We made it. We are officially in 2022. 
And that might sound crazy because if you're like me, you might still be processing 2019. And so as we entered 2022, I wonder, how have you felt? Maybe you're hopeful, maybe you're thankful, or maybe you're exhausted even though it's just January. Whatever it is you're feeling, I believe Jesus changes lives and Scripture can change our perspective. And today, we begin a sermon series looking at the life of Jesus through the Gospel of Mark. And I can't wait to dig in with you. But before we read the passage, for those of us for whom Mark is new, Mark is one of the four Gospels right at the start of the New Testament that tell us about the life and ministry of Jesus. The other three Gospels are Matthew, Luke and John. And of all four, Mark is the shortest one. There are just about 16 chapters. It was also probably the first of all four to have been written. Um, and despite that, Mark has designed this book really carefully. He's organized it into three parts, almost like a journey, beginning in Galilee in chapters 1 to 8 and ending in Jerusalem in chapters 10 to 16. And in between, he is like many Malaysian late to their appointment texting as they leave their home on the way. In part one, the question Mark is asking his audience is who is Jesus? In part two, the disciples, after having spent some time with Jesus, they wrestle with the idea of who Jesus is. And in part three, we see how the story unfolds with Mark revealing who Jesus ultimately is, that he is the Messianic King. Now we'll see over the next few weeks that so much of the Gospel of Mark attempts to work out who Jesus is. So in verse 1, right at the start, Mark gives us the Sparks Notes version of everything he's about to say. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So why don't we look together at the passage now, reading from verses 1 to 13. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, during this time, the rabbis taught that a teacher or a master can require just about anything from their followers or servants except to take off their sandals. So the fact that John said that even he was not worthy to untie Jesus' sandals, it showed a humility, but it also gave you a picture of who Jesus is. Reading again from verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Amen. Who is John the Baptist? Who is this mystery man who wore camel's hair, and he lived on a diet of locusts and wild honey? You know, the first time I read about John, I thought he was a little eccentric, like a cross between Bear Girls and Man vs. Wild, and Russell, the wilderness explorer from the movie Up. From other parts of the New Testament, we are told that John was Jesus' cousin, just six months older than him. And just as Jesus' birth was miraculous, John was born to Elizabeth, who was not only barren, but also she and her husband Zechariah were very old. So it was a pretty miraculous birth too. 
We are told that before John was born, an angel spoke over his life. His birth had been foretold, his destiny determined, and his future proclaimed as the one who would go before Jesus to pave the way. Wow, that's a pretty big deal. And so he lived with single-minded clarity. It was from the wilderness he lived out his purpose. For John, the wilderness wasn't a whimsical weekend idea. It was a way of life. And yet in the past two years, many of us have somehow found ourselves walking through a wilderness season in our lives. You know, the wilderness appears nearly 300 times in Scripture. And I wonder, what does walking through a wilderness look like in your life? To me, I think it can sometimes look like lack, longing, or loneliness. It can often feel a little wild and desolate. You know, instead of a safe space, you're exposed to the elements, and it can be exhausting. Maybe you've just come out of the wilderness, but you're still working out what God was up to during that time. Or maybe you're still right in the thick of it, waiting, worrying, wandering, waiting for a breakthrough in your life, worrying if this pandemic might ever end, wandering aimlessly through what feels like a never-ending wilderness. Maybe it's gone on so long you're resigned to thinking, what if the wilderness is the way? If this is you, I want you to know, your wilderness will not be wasted. God will put to use what you're going through. And I believe He's with you and has a word for you. The first thing God might be saying to us in the wilderness of our lives is that He's calling us to repentance. In verse 4, it says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, if I'm being honest, this sentence has a lot of words that I heard growing up in church, but often fail to fully understand. I used to believe that repentance meant feeling lots of guilt and shame or constantly beating myself up for a mistake I'd made. But in the New Testament Greek, the word used for repentance is metanoia, and it means to have a change of mind. Maybe another way to put it is to think differently afterwards. And the word afterwards is important because it tells you that it's a response of conviction resulting in a change in action. I um, had to repent recently. You see, I was bald for the first few years of my life, and it was the same for our two-year-old Levi. So when he was bald for the first year of his life, I thought, you know, my hair grew out eventually, so his will too, right? It must do. But when his hair did start to grow out, it was uneven and kind of wispy. I mean, basically this. (laughs) Loads of hair around here, but big bald spot at the top. No surprise where he got it from basically this. And so people would often politely suggest that maybe we shaved his head. You mean, you know, it was a family tradition for them. It worked for their nephew or their grandson. But I push back every single time. I mean, I'm his mom. And since I'm so objective and so unbiased in my judgment of my son's hair, I could veto this decision, right? Until one day, his teachers at his nursery kind of awkwardly put me aside and they said, um, Miss, kami ada berbincang. Miss, we've been discussing. Kami semua rasa Levi kena potong rambut dia. Kalau tak, nanti pelik. <laughs> we have unanimously decided that Levi needs to shave his head because it looks a little strange. Needless to say, we shaved his head and in two months, his hair grew out to a full head of hair. I, on the other hand, ate lots of humble pie. What might God be calling you to turn towards today? I once heard about this pastor who was conducting a discipleship class at church and he asked, what must we do before we can expect forgiveness from sin? After a long silence, one of the guys in the class, he raised his hand and he said, "Um, sin? None of us are excluded from sin. Scripture tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short. And when John preached the baptism of repentance, we see in verse 5 that the people responded to it with two actions. Firstly, a baptism of water, and secondly, a confession of sins. John's baptism was not a new thing at the time. 
it was actually quite common for Gentiles who wanted to become Jews to be baptized. It was through sprinkling with water. But what made John's baptism unique is that he would not just sprinkle, but he would completely immerse them, including the Jews. So for a Jew to be baptized during that day was essentially to say, I confess that I'm on the same level as a non-Jew, which at the time was a huge thing to admit. Baptism wasn't just a symbol of dying to a life of sin. It was also a picture of being raised to new life in Jesus. So you might ask, since baptism was such an important act, why was it necessary to also confess our sins? Confession here doesn't look like catching God in a good mood and, you know, going up to Him to say sorry, hoping that maybe He might just for this one time just possibly forgive you. Unlike this old meme, God is not a withdrawn, high expectations father who's always in a bad mood. His love for you is unconditional, unending and unchanging. And even before we ask, He's already offered us forgiveness. Repentance is the privilege of receiving that forgiveness, turning away from a life of sin so we can turn towards a fullness of life in Him. And as we do that, we acknowledge it through our confession. More than saying sorry, confession is a declaration. It is from this place of forgiveness we experience freedom from a life of sin. But how do we do this? The way to repentance is found in the narrow road of humility. Rick Warren said, Humility isn't dying, denying your strengths, it's being honest about your weaknesses. And I love what St. Augustine said, Do you wish to rise? Begin by descending. You plan a tower that will pierce the clouds? Lay first the foundation of humility. John the Baptist shows us through repentance, God draws us in His direction. Through confession, we develop a clarity of vision. Through humility, we reap a harvest. And it's from the wilderness we begin to prepare the way. In other words, we prepare the way by persisting in the wilderness. Why is that? Well, the second thing that God might be doing in the wilderness in our lives is that He's building in us resilience. Now, resilience is one of those buzzwords that has been used a lot, especially in the past decade. And um, when I looked up the word resilience on Google, these images popped up. Basically, a boxing chicken boxing to its death. Um, a McDonald's meal in disguise because mums are pretty resilient. And as a child of the 90s, the first thing I think of is that song by the British group Chumbawamba. And if you know it, you can sing along with me in front of your screens. It goes, I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never going to keep me down. And, and I think that that is what resilience is. You get knocked down, but then you get back up again and again and again. We know deep inside of us that resilience is what carries us through crises and enables us to endure. It's one of the best predictors of leadership. And yet there have been days this season I haven't felt very resilient at all. And if you're like me, you may be asking, how can I grow in my resilience today? I think the first thing to say is that resilience is formed in the crucible of crisis. You may not feel like you've gone through many crises in your life, but if you've led yourself, your family, or your team through the past two years, then you have led through a crisis. None of us had lived through a pandemic this scale before. So for many of us, it has been like a wilderness. But it's how we respond that develops our resilience. God has a purpose for your wilderness. He's giving you strength in your season of scarcity. The second thing is that resilience is cultivated in the quality of close relationships. I read an article recently that said that basically every academic study of resilience in the last 50 years, they all agree on the one thing that is the most important determinant of resilience, and that is the quality of our close personal relationships. In fact, research shows that highly resilient people tend to find meaning in God and have relationships in church, which makes all of you here so well done. A key to developing resilience is to grow in our relationships. That's why John pointed people to having a relationship with Jesus. 
The third thing is that our resilience is linked to our capacity for repair. And I want to spend a bit more time here. You see, the wilderness can be confronting. And I was um, chatting with a friend recently, and as we were reflecting on this past season, she said something I thought was so profound. She basically said, because of the constant lockdowns, some of the places we used to go to get away were now no longer places we could go to. And it's forced us to deal with some of the things in our hearts that we used to be able to run from. Maybe you're going through an external wilderness because of a relationship or circumstances in your workplace or your home. Or maybe it's an internal wilderness, one you're wrestling with in your heart. Whatever it is you're going through, if you're weary from your wilderness, I want you to know that God is in the wilderness with you. How do I know this? You see, if we read on, it says in verses 12 to 13, at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. So immediately after Jesus was baptized, he went out into the wilderness. And not only that, we see that Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness on purpose. At the very end of this chapter, chapter 1, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and went off to a solitary, desolate place where he prayed. In Luke 5, 16, it says, But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Jesus knew he needed to be with the Father to gain strength, especially in a season of stretch. It's been said that in a season of success, Jesus withdrew to the wilderness. In a season of busyness, he would climb a mountain. And in a season of crisis, he would go to the garden. Jesus withdrew on purpose to pray. Whether you're winning or whether you're in the wilderness, I wonder if God is inviting you to withdraw to be with Him too. One of Rick Warren's habits is to divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually. And because as every woman who's given birth can tell you, every time there's stretching, there's bound to be some tearing. And the only one who can truly repair is Jesus. Resilience isn't running from the problem, is running towards the one who can repair us. As we withdraw on purpose to be with God, He provides the inner resources to give us a steadfast resilience. In a wilderness that poses danger, God is your deliverer. In a season of isolation, God is closer than ever. In a time of longing and lack, the wilderness is a place of encounter. Through Jesus, in the wilderness, we are made whole. The wilderness we run to will help us withstand the wilderness we stumble into. The third and final thing that God might be doing in the wilderness in our lives is that He's drawing us to relationship with Him. We were um, given this book for Levi's birthday recently called Where the Wild Things Are. It's, it's about a little boy named Max who's been naughty and he is punished by being sent to bed without his dinner. And so he ends up sailing to um, an island inhabited by monsters called Wild Things. Eventually, he's declared the most wild thing of them all and he's declared their king. And as I read it again recently, I was drawn to this one particular line in the book where it says, And Max was the king of all wild things, but he was lonely and wanted to be where someone loved him best of all. So Max decides to go home. He decides to give up being king. And he discovers that dinner is waiting for him and it's still hot. There's something about the wilderness that can fill our hearts with longing. Just as Max longed for someone who loved him best of all, John prepared the way for Jesus, the one who gave his life for us all. Just as Max discovers dinner at the end of his wilderness adventure, the Israelites end up in the land of milk and honey after 40 years of wandering in obscurity. Just as Max returned for relationship, God is calling us to commune with Him. 
You see, the wilderness in the New Testament mirrors the wilderness of the Old Testament. Mark set the scene in the desert on purpose. For the audience he was writing to at the time, the wilderness narrative was ingrained in Hebrew memory. But Mark turns the wilderness narrative on its head. Instead of wandering in the desert, John is baptizing and turning people to Jesus. And while Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he overcomes. Someone once said to me, it's easier to endure when I know the ending. And so if you fast forward all the way to the end of Scripture, to Revelation, we see how the story ends in a garden city. So while we begin with the wilderness, we can endure the journey as we make our way to our destination, the garden. Just as repentance is a response of conviction, resilience is a response of hope. If there's anything we can remember as we navigate the wilderness together, is that the wilderness always ends with hope. Hope in a promised land, hope that death is not the end, and that one day Jesus will make all things right again. But more than looking towards the end, we keep going because of what happened at the start. Right before Jesus went into the wilderness, we see in verse 11, And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. God the Father spoke his identity over Jesus right before he went into the wilderness alone. And before he was sent, he was a son. Jesus withstood the wilderness as he recalled the words the Father spoke over him. And I wonder if some of us need to hear these words spoken over us today. You are my son and daughter, whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. God the Father, He's not withdrawn. He loves you. He fights for you. He's right in the wilderness with you. Later on, as Jesus says where He is going, that He would die on a cross and rise from the dead to prepare a place for us in heaven, one of the disciples asked Him, But Jesus, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. So if you feel you've lost your way or you're resigned to thinking that the wilderness is the way, know that Jesus is the way in the wilderness. If knowing the end helps us to have hope and knowing the start helps us keep going, in between we can weather the wilderness because we do it with Him. And when the wandering becomes too wearisome, remember that Jesus the way is in the wilderness with you. Amen. Let's just take a moment to invite the Holy Spirit to speak with us. Um, I'd love for you to stand if you are able to. Um, If you can put out your hands like this, it's just a sign that says, Holy Spirit, I'm welcome. I'm, I'm welcoming you. Come and speak to me today. And I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us right now. Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. I had a sense for someone here who um, you might feel like you're winning, uh, you're in a season of winning, and yet everyone around you is in a season of wilderness. And you have a bit of survivor's guilt, um, and I think God wants to give you wisdom on how you can come alongside them, how you can walk with them um, and be uh, the love of Jesus with them in their time of wilderness. There might also be someone here, um, and this You know, 2021 has just felt like one thing after another. Um, And at some point, actually, you thought to yourself, I can't just catch a break. If this is you, um, I think God just wants to remind you that He's with you in the wilderness. He's fighting for you. um, And He's got things under control, even if it doesn't feel like it. This might also feel a bit... um, Uh, random, but if there's a Pauline watching this, um, I believe that God is wanting to say to you that... um, If you're worried about your son, he uh, is taking good care of him. He loves him so much and he's with you um, and he's got your back. He's got your whole family's back. So he's with you. 
Um, but if there's anyone else who would love prayer, we would love to pray with you. Just um, reach out to one of our team and they will get back in touch with you and pray with you. Let's continue now with this final song of worship.
Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you and ask for more of your guidance and perseverance in times of waiting, O oh Lord God. Uh, let us learn to lean into your word and into your voice, O oh Lord God, in times of waiting. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that you will lead us in times of challenges uh, and as well uh, to remember to give thanks to you as well, Lord God, when we come out the other side. Uh, we thank you and we lift up our days to you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today at HTBB Online. We'll see you next week. Have a great week ahead. Bye! Bye.